As we come to our God this morning, let us first look at Psalm 111, where we have these words of our God. This is what it says. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. God's work is great. It is glorious. We have seen his work in our lives. We have seen his work in the Lord Jesus Christ and how good it is. And it is full of splendor. It is full of majesty. Who else could forgive the way that God has forgiven? Who else could offer life the way our God has offered life all through his son, Jesus? Well, let us pray to our God as we give him praise. Lord, our God, as we come before you this morning, we acknowledge you as the only true God, the one who has life in himself and yet has given us life. You have created us in your image and we see the power of that work. But more than this, Father, when we wandered astray, you called us back to yourself through the giving of your only Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we who have put our faith in him would have the promise of the forgiveness of sin and eternal life. How good and majestic are all your works toward us. How right it is that we should praise and give you thanks. Oh, Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would continue to help us as we seek to live lives that bring honour and glory to your name. Transform us by the renewing of our mind. Renew a right spirit within us. Because we know, Father, that we have fallen short of your glory. That we have sinned against you. We have become selfish at times. We have sought to do things our own way. We have been stubborn. Refused to bow the knee at your throne of grace. We have been self-righteous thinking that we know best. Oh, forgive us, Father, for it weighs heavily upon us that we have transgressed your good law. But in Christ you have forgiven us, and that promise is sure. And you tell us in your word that whenever we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. Not because we are good and righteous people, not because we can somehow make up for our wrongs by doing good, but because Christ has spilled his blood for us. He has paid the penalty of death that we each deserve. And so we are assured of forgiveness, assured of having our relationship with you restored and living in a right way with you. Continue to transform us by the Spirit who works in us, that we might become more and more like Christ, who served you perfectly without sin. O oh Lord our God, this day we ask that you would be with us, that your Spirit would be working in us, drawing us to each other, drawing us more and more to Christ. O oh Lord our God, do that work, we pray. And may our praise of your name be so pleasant and so good that it would be a taste of what life in your eternal kingdom is like. O oh Lord our God, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing our first song. It's number 91 in your uh, Rejoice hymn books. Come now, almighty King.
Let's open our Bibles to uh, our first reading. Um, now, I'm doing two readings from 1 Samuel this morning, and, and um, the two readings are bracketing uh, the, the, the part of Samuel that I want us to focus on. I want to focus on the three chapters of Samuel 5, 6, and 7, uh, but we're going to just read 5 and, and, and part of 7 this morning. So uh, this is 1 Samuel 5. Uh, it's, it's just the 12 verses. Uh, we're going to read the whole of chapter 5. It's found on page 270 of your Pew Bibles, and we're going to begin at verse 1. So 1 Samuel 5, and beginning at verse 1. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumours, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us, and Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered all the lords of the Philistines and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic. And he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumours, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. We're going to uh, continue now in a time of prayer as we pray for 
our congregation and our world. Uh, there are some prayer points in your uh, peer sheets. Please take those home uh, and, and uh, make use of them in your own prayer time. But for now, let us come before our God and pray. Oh Lord, our God, we thank you and praise you once more that the throne room of your grace is open to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. That by his death, when that curtain was torn in two, the way to your throne room was declared open if we come trusting in Jesus. And so we do that now. And we ask, Father, that you would watch over and care for your people. We thank you, Father, for this opportunity to make our needs known to you. We thank you that you hear our prayer, that you are a God who delights to bring blessing upon his people. And so we pray, Father, that you will continue to watch over this congregation. Continue to encourage us and strengthen us in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to build us that we might be a witness to the world around us. We ask, Father, that even as we go out from this place where we are gathered together to give you praise and glory, that we may go out with that praise and glory ever in our minds and on our lips, ready to speak of the hope that is within us to those around us, that they too would hear the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ that they too would be moved by your spirit uh, to put their faith and their trust in him. Oh, give us opportunities, we pray, to make your good news known and make your spirit go ahead of us to prepare the ground that there would be hearts that are, are ready to embrace the promises that you have given them through Christ. Oh, Lord our God, equip us embolden us encourage us to do this work for the glory of your name for we long to see your kingdom on earth built up and established we long to see days of revival days of awakening and enlivening but this is a work that only you can do by your spirit oh use us as you will we pray to be ambassadors and servants to that end. We pray, Father, for our congregation that we would be able to make plans for the future, that we would be able to establish ourselves in a place of your choosing, that on the ballerine we might be that witness where there are so many thousands of people who don't yet know you. Oh Lord our God, may we be a hub from which the glory of Christ is known. Heavenly Father, we do also pray for those who are grieving. And we know of many who we have had contact with in recent days and, and our own congregational members, especially Merle. And we ask your blessing upon them. We ask your blessing, blessing upon Dorothy as she seeks to navigate what her life looks like now and upon Merle as well for the same reason. Comfort them in their distress. In the quiet when their grief is heavy upon them, remind them of your presence with them. And help us to be your servants here as well, that we would show compassion and love to them, that we would offer our care and support as those who have been with Christ, as those who honour them as our brothers and sisters. Oh Lord our God, we ask that you would continue to be with those who are facing illness and we ask your hand to be upon them to bring them back to health, to restore them if that is your will. But even in their ill health, Father, keep them close to you. Strengthen their faith that they may rest assured in the hope that is theirs through Christ. We thank you, Father, for the work of the many um, doctors and nurses and medical professionals around us who are able to help us so abundantly well. And we ask your blessing upon them as they do their work. We pray, Father, this day, especially for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander brothers and sisters, those who might be feeling disappointed from the outcome 
of the referendum, let them know that they are not forgotten, that we still care, that our compassion is for them, that we want the troubles that plague many of these to be remedied. But we also ask that you would raise up people who know Christ to serve in that compassionate and loving way. And that as they serve, the very person of Christ would become known among them. As it has been in days past, we thank you for the efforts of so many who have gone out and, and spoken the truth about Jesus into these communities. And many who have embraced that truth, may it continue to go forward. Because we know that in Christ there is the promise and the sure and certain promise of complete restoration and reconciliation, not with other people, but reconciliation with you, our Father, through the forgiveness of sin. And that is the reconciliation that is most needed amongst all people, not just our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, communities, but all people in this nation need to know that there is a way to be reconciled with you, our Heavenly Father. And may your people be motivated and driven to share the means by which this can happen, which comes by faith through trusting in who Jesus is and what he has done. We pray for those who are impacted by the unrest and the war that is now descending upon Israel and the Gaza. We pray, Father, that where it is possible, life would be preserved. But also we pray that peace would be restored. We pray, Father, for uh, those once more of our brothers and sisters who are caught up in this war. We ask, Father, that you would have your protective hand over them. But even still, you would embolden them to speak of the peace that they know, the peace that surpasses all understanding that comes to those who trust in Jesus. Uh, for this is the message that all need to hear, whether Jew or Islam or Arab, whatever their faith background is, the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to be proclaimed. And only through him can true peace and reconciliation and hope be delivered. Oh Lord our God, we pray for the work of many people who are in this situation, who are faithful, who are doing that work, that you would go ahead of them and prepare the ground that many will come to faith in Christ. And we do look forward, Father, for the day when Christ will return and all will stand before him. Or may we be ready on that day to give an account of ourselves that we have put our faith in Christ and we stand righteous before you because we have trusted in him. O Lord our God, that is the promise of your word and that is our eternal hope. O Lord our God, we look forward to the day of Jesus' return. Keep us faithful in Christ until that day. For we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing again. Uh, this time, oh, actually, uh, we're singing number 70 in your Rejoice hymn books. Uh, the song is Praise My Soul, the King of Heaven. And as we sing this song, the uh, offering will be collected. So we'll remain seated for the first four verses and then stand for the last verse.
Uh, let us pray. Oh Lord our God, we thank you so much for your love for us in Jesus Christ, for the way that you provide abundantly for us. As we return these offerings to you, we return not just these, but our very selves to you, that you might use us for the glory of your kingdom as we go out to proclaim the good news of salvation to others. Oh Lord our God, we pray that you would help us, encourage us and sustain us by your grace and mercy as we seek to do your will, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's open our Bibles once again. And this time we're turning over the page to 1 Samuel 7 on uh, page what is it, 270, I think, 271, something like that. I haven't got the page number in front of me. Oh, there it is, 272. Oh, it was almost right. 272 in your pew Bibles. 1 Samuel 7. And I'm going to read from verse 3 to the end of the chapter. So this is what God's word says. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and they served the Lord only. Then Samuel said, Gather all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered at Mizpah, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the people of Israel at Mizpah. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel, as Samuel... uh, And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel, and the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. And the men of Israel went out from Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen, And called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities that the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron to Gath. And Israel delivered their territory from the hand of the Philistines. There was peace also between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went on a circuit year by year to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. Then he would return to Ramah, for his home was there, and there also he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to the Lord. Well, let's spend some time in prayer as we explore God's word and see what he has to say to us. Let us pray. Lord our God, as we come before you, we thank you for your word to us. We ask this day that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive it, that it might bring blessing to us, it might bring transformation and change in our lives as we seek to become like the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, instruct us, we pray, that your spirit might be with us, enlightening us and engaging us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as I was saying to the children, in Australia we have a very strange culture in that we like to be familiar with people. Uh, When I was working for IBM, we had the CEO of IBM uh, come to our office. His name was Mr. Lou Gehrig. And he came to one of our sites and most of the people who were chatting with him called him Lou. 
That's a very strange thing. Uh, at, the, at the head office of IBM in New York, oh no, no, he's Mr. Gehrig. You don't dare call him by his first name. But in Australia, that's how he was addressed. Now, this kind of familiarity in, in some nations, in some countries, it might even be considered rude and disrespectful. But we, we tend to look at it as just another, a new, another unique way that we are Australian. Well, what we see in these events recorded in 1 Samuel chapters 5 to the end of chapter 7 is God can't be treated that casually. He's a holy God. He's a mighty God. He's the only God. And the lesson that we are to learn from 1 Samuel 5 to 1 Samuel 7 is that God is to be revered. It's a, it's a, that's a word that's sort of fallen out of our, of our vocabulary. The, this idea of reverence and someone being revered. Well, God is to be revered. In fact, in Proverbs 1 verse 7, uh, we are told the fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. The writer of the book of Ecclesiastes ends with something similar in Ecclesiastes 12. He says, the end of the matter, all has been heard, fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. This is nothing new. In Deuteronomy 6, when, when the people of Israel are, are, are instructed to pass on to their children the wonderful works that God did in bringing them out of Egypt, they're instructed to say to their children, the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are this day. Understanding who God is as a holy God, that is, he's, he's completely different to us, perfect in all his character, unlike us. If we are to live our lives in a right relationship with him, we need to know him as the holy God. That's really important. Now, of course, we, we can only live in a right relationship with God because of his grace to us in securing forgiveness through, through uh, faith in Jesus. That's the only way we can know him. It's by his grace. But once in that relationship, we must make sure that we relate to God rightly in the way that he's revealed to us that he wants us to relate with him. And so we see two ways in 1, in 1 Samuel, chapters 5 to 7, in which people did not relate to God rightly. We saw the Philistines, who think that God can be captured and subdued. We see some of the people of Israel who think God can be approached however they see fit in 1 Samuel 6. Uh, but also in 1 Samuel 7, we see God's people coming to an understanding of his holiness, approaching him with reverence, and it's then that we see God acting to protect the people upon whom his grace rests. So first, there's no competition when it comes to God. 1 Samuel 5 tells us of the capture of the Ark of the Covenant after the people of Israel foolishly brought it into the battle with the Philistines, thinking they could somehow manipulate God to do their will. Of course, their attempts fail. Many thousands of Israelites get killed in battle and the Ark gets captured. And then we follow the ark in 1 Samuel 5 into the camp of the Philistines, into the city of Ashdod. And it's taken right into the temple of their god Dagon. You see, what were the Philistines doing? Well, uh, the Israelites were defeated. Therefore, they're saying, our god is mightier than your god. Therefore, we bring him into the temple so your god can serve our god. Can you see that that's what they're doing? But what happens? Well, the next morning, what do they find? Their idol, their so-called god, Dagon, fallen face down on the ground before the Ark of the Covenant. There's something important in that detail that's recorded. Dagon hasn't just fallen face down before the Ark of the Covenant, as though in worship of the true God. God 
has no competition. God's power is not restricted, not by the location and certainly not by some hand-fashioned idol. And I think it's very, I think it's very telling in 1 Samuel 5 uh, where it speaks of what happens after the people found Dagon on the ground. What does it say? They took Dagon and put him back in his place. That's very interesting, isn't it? Their God cannot put himself back. He needs people to help him. Well, that's going to be important in a little while, as we'll see. But then they they get him back up, and the next morning, well, Dagon is utterly defeated. Not only face down on the ground this time, but face down on the ground, his head's come off, his arms have come off. Completely and utterly defeated. No way of pulling himself back together. No way of resetting himself back in his place. God has no competition. Moreover, we read of God's wrath against the people of Philistia. Tumors and disease spread through the city of Ashdod. And the people there recognize that this is the hand of God against them. That's what they say. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod. And he terrified them and afflicted them with tumours, verse 6. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, The ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. Do you see? They recognise why this is happening. It's because of God. God has no competition. He is the Almighty. He is the living God, even over those who have chosen not to respect him, not to honour him and not to know him. He is still sovereign over them. So the Philistines go, well, what do we do with this? We've got to get him out of Ashdod. And so they send it to another city, Gath. And what happens in Gath? More disease, more tumours break out in the people of Gath. And so the people of Gath go, well, how do we fix this? I know. We'll send the Ark of the, God of the, Cove- uh, we'll send the, Ark of the Covenant down to Ekron. That's what we'll do. And the people of Ekron hear this and go, hang on, no. We've seen what's happened there. We're not, we're not, we're not buying that one. And they say, verse 11, let's just send it back to Israel. Now, it's really, it's really interesting here. Uh, at the end of, of chapter 7, where do we find the cities of Ekron and Gath firmly back in the hands of Israel? So it just says, these, these people of, of Philistia, they've got no regard for the cities that they've taken. They still view them as, as belonging to Israel. And God knows that this is the land that he gave to his people and he restores it to them at the end. Uh, but, but here we have Ekron going, send it back to Israel, verse 11. And the priests get together and they go, well, yeah, you know what? We'll do that. But we'll do it in such a way. And this is in uh, 1 Samuel 6. We're going to do it in such a way that's going to put God to the test and make it incredibly difficult for the ark to get back to Israel. So in 1 Samuel 6, this is the plan that they hatch. They said, uh, take, this is uh, 1 Samuel 6 verse 7, take and prepare a new cart and two milk cows on which there has never come a yoke and yoke the cows to the cart, but take their calves home away from them. Then take the ark of the Lord, put it on the cart and then put it in a box at its side, the figures of gold, which you are returning to him as a guilt offering and then send it off and let it go its way. So this is their great plan and they're making it extraordinarily difficult. Two cows who have never been yoked before, never been yoked together, never been yoked on their own even. I uh, don't know if you know much about handling animals, but they don't actually like things to be different. They kick back against it. They fight it. 
And especially when you're yoking two animals together, well, usually you'd have one that's experienced with one that is less experienced, and so that the other one gets trained. But well, these are both unexperienced. They're going to go in any which direction. But not only that, these two cows have just had calves. The natural instinct for these cows is to go back to their calves. So they're making it extraordinarily difficult for this ark to return to Israel. Almost impossible, you might say. So the Philistines do all this and they send the cows with the ark in the cart down the road to Israel to a town called Beth Shemesh. And then in verse 12, this is what happens. We are told the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh. Along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. What happened with Dagon? Oh, he fell down and the people had to replace him. He fell down and his head and his arms fell off and he couldn't pull himself together. He couldn't get himself back on the shelf or wherever it was he was placed. What happens... When the Ark of the Covenant of God is sent away back to Israel, against all odds, it gets back to Israel. God has no competition. God is not some dumb idol. God is not some useless thing that needs mankind's intervention to help him. He accomplishes his will. He is the all-powerful, ever-living God. He has no competition. Now you may think, well, we understand that about God. We know that of you. We, we're not ones, we're not out there serving idols or false gods. We, we, we understand that, that God has no competition. We understand that He's the living, holy God. But it's easy to replace God or treat him as second best. And if we think about our modern lives, or just think about the many insurances that we buy. House, car, contents, death, disability, public liability, health insurance, and even these days, pet insurance. Now, uh, these are great provisions by God. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't go and buy insurance. I I think it's a good thing. Uh, Don't hear me saying that. But they're the provision of God and they must be put in their place. Our trust and our reliance is upon the power and the provision of God first and foremost. We must rely upon him. These other things are secondary to God. Sometimes as Christians, we think of these things differently. And it comes down to what is really a hard issue. A hard issue that declares, I must first do all that I can to materially provide for my comfort and my needs. And then I put the rest into God's hands. Well, that makes an idol out of your comfort, out of your your security. That makes an idol out of your wealth. It's actually to make an idol out of yourself. Thinking, I must do it all, and then the things that I can't do, I give to God. That's the wrong way around. That means you're trusting in yourself, and you're not casting your care and anxieties upon the almighty, all-living, powerful, holy God. Now, It can also be a trap for us as a congregation as we look to the future, as we look to be in a position to have our own building, perhaps our own manse. But what are we relying on for that to happen? Are we trusting in God that he will give us what we need? Is that where our hopes are in the first place? Or are we trusting in the works of others as we wait the sale of property? How is it shown? Are we engaged in prayer that God's the one to be honoured regardless 
of whether we get funds to purchase a property. Are we engaged in prayer that declares God's will as what we want our will to be, even if that means we never get property? Because God will book no competition. Insurance companies can fail. <laughs> and in fact, they have failed. And churches are finding out that at the current time, there's only one insurance company who will even come close to insuring churches in this nation now. Banks can collapse. There's nothing you can do about it when they do. But God is always powerful, always almighty, and God provides for his people. He will uphold his holy name. He will defend his holy name. And there is a day coming when none will doubt his holiness and his power. Because when Christ returns, he will be clearly identified and he will come with all the glory, all the power of the living God, and none will be able to deny him. So what do you do with God now? Well, here's my suggestion. Take him seriously. And if you are going to have a right relationship with him, put him first. Above finances, above security, above all other things, put God first. Uh, now, what, what, what that's, what's that going to look like? Well, it might mean that you are going to engage in a more meaningful prayer life. You want to know him better. So it might mean that you will read his word because that's where you learn about who God is and what his will is for this world. Well, second thing, God can't be treated casually. When the ark makes its way back to Israel in 1 Samuel 6... It seems at first that the people of Beth Shemesh are going to do the right thing. In verse 15, we see the Levites are coming to take down the Ark of the Lord. This is the right thing to do. The Levites were the ones who had charge over the Ark of the Covenant of God. Absolutely good. Fantastic. And the people offer burnt offerings and sacrifices to God. But we also find out that the people of Beth Shemesh approach God somewhat casually. In verse 19, we're told the Lord struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 of the men and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great blow. Where was the ark supposed to be? What are the instructions regarding it? Well, it goes back to Exodus. In Exodus 26, 34, God says to Moses, he shall put the mercy seat on the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. That's the, right in the, uh, in, in the divided part of the tabernacle. It's the place where uh, the priest was only allowed, the high priest alone was allowed to go in there, and then only once a year. It was, it was to remind the people of God's holiness, even as he was saying to his people, but I want to be near you. You can't be too close to me because I am completely holy. Your sin is the barrier. But I want to be with you nonetheless and in your midst because I am your God and you are my people. So when the ark arrives at Beth Shemesh and the people there look upon the ark of the covenant, it's as though the people of Beth Shemesh have said, it doesn't matter how God says he is to be approached, we're going to decide how we can approach him. We're going to decide for ourselves what's an acceptable way to approach God. Well, God won't be treated so casually, even by this people upon whom he has set his heart. And we see them being struck down. And they understand that once this happened, and they ask the right question, who's able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? That's what they say. Who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? That's verse 20. And then they call out to the people of kiriath Jerem, another town. And they say, bring the ark back to your own town. And they do, and they place it in the house of Aminadab. Now, it's still not in its right place. But now they're not gazing on it casually and approaching it 
however they want. The message for us today is the same. We don't get to treat God casually. I remember being in a young adults group where one of the young women came in and had a t-shirt on bearing a purported image of Jesus with the words on it saying, Jesus is my homeboy. I don't think there are many Christians who treat Jesus that way. It's a casual familiarity that the word of God doesn't allow for. I've also been at prayer meetings where someone has there started their prayer with Dear Daddy. Again, this is a familiarity and a closeness that I don't think we see that God allows for in his word. And I've heard other Christians say things like, Oh yeah, life's going all right. I've got my best mate right beside me in reference to Jesus or in some cases to God the Father himself. That's not right. That's not how we are to approach God. And God's not going to be treated casually. We see that in 1 Samuel 6. A proper understanding of who God is will help us to see that we can't approach God casually and treat God in that way. He's not going to be dishonoured or approached in a way that we think is right. He has directed to us in his word how we are to approach him, how we are to honour him, how we are to respect him. We can't say to God, you ought to be happy with anything that I do for you in your name. That's not right. And God's dictated to us. He's told us, I am a holy God. This is how you approach me. He is the one who's done everything for us. From our creation to our redemption through faith in Jesus Christ. He's shown us his power and his might. He's therefore to be respected. And our approach to him must be in a respectful way. And so we must first ask the question, how do we approach him? How does he tell us to approach him? Well, it's found in his word. So to understand how to approach God in the way that he has determined is right and appropriate is found in his word. He never gives us the green light to approach him casually or in any way that we praise. It's always with reverence, understanding who he is, with humility, knowing how well short of his glory we are, and with thankfulness, knowing the full weight of the things that he has done for us, the grace he has given us, the mercy he has shown us, and the patience that he has had with us. And when God is revered and honoured by his people, Respected and approached according to the way he's determined he's to be approached. Well, then God acts for the good of his people. And you see that unfolding in 1 Samuel 7 verses 3 to 17. Look at how it begins. Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign God and the Ashtaroth from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. And so the people put away the Baals and the Ashtaroth and they served the Lord only. Do you see now there's no competition. A right return to the Lord means putting away all other things. Serve God first, serve God only. That's the message. That's what the people do. And if they, people of Israel have a real love for God, if you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, this is the whole of their entire being, all their emotional, all their will, all their mind coming to God, coming only to God, delivering them whole, their whole selves to him. They're approaching him now as the only true God. And they chucked away all their useless idols and their false idols, which they'd previously be serving, cast them aside as worthless because God has no competition. And then, and then they, they come before God and listen to what they say in verse 6 of, verse, of chapter 7. We have sinned against the Lord. Do you see how they respect God? 
they know that they've disobeyed him, been working against him. And they come with humility. We have sinned against the Lord, is what they say. And then Samuel prays for them. They come to Samuel, verse 8, and they say, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he might save us from the hand of the Philistines. There's a real difference, isn't there, between what's going on in 1 Samuel 8 and what happened all the way back in 1 Samuel 4. When the Philistines came against Israel in 1 Samuel 4, what was their, what was their solution? Bring the ark of the God into the battle and he'll have to save us because he has to, he has to uh, honor his own reputation. This time when the Philistines come against them, what do they do? Pray for us, Samuel. Cry out to us, to the Lord our God. Oh, this is the right approach. We have sinned. They recognize that God is a holy God and that they've sinned against him. And they ask for his help. They don't presume upon his grace. And they make appropriate offerings to the Lord in verses 9 and 10. There was prayer. There was an approach to God that honored his power, that honored his holiness. They approached him with humility and reverence. And what's the result? Well, in verse 10, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before all Israel. When God is revered and honoured and approached in the way that he has determined according to his own word that he is to be approached, then he acts for the good of his people. What's the conclusion of, of this incident with Samuel and all Israel? Verse 12, Samuel took a stone and set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. God will help his people in distress when they approach him in the right way, according to the way that he has declared he is to be approached. In 1 Samuel 7, we saw confession. We saw repentance. We saw offering and sacrifice through humble prayer and dependence. And nothing has changed for God's people. We still need the right offering for God's people today. The right offering, the right sacrifice has been provided for us by God himself in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we, we have no hope of approaching God without Jesus' death on the cross. We have no hope of the forgiveness of sin without Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. We must approach God through trusting in Jesus Christ. It's not automatic access for all people in every place and every time. No one can just cry out to God at any moment and say, please hear me. No, you must come to God trusting in Jesus Christ. Because he is the only sacrifice that we have to atone for our sin. And it's the sacrifice that God provided for us. But we also need to repent of our sin. That is to turn away from a life that says I'm depending only on me or even partly on me. We need to turn away from our reliance on money, on friends, on health care, on insurances, on government, on family and declare that our reliance must first be upon God. And then we need to live lives that honour him above all other things in this world. Repentance is turning away from that which offends God to doing that which pleases God. And then we can approach him with humble prayer, recognising that this God is the all-powerful creator of the universe. And that it's only by his grace that we've been given the opportunity to draw near to him. Recognise that he has done everything and we've contributed nothing to our salvation. Because then we will approach God rightly with, thanks, with thanksgiving and his praise on our lips. 
approaching him recognising that every outcome is solely in his sovereign hand and he will act for the good of his people. But I hear someone say, but haven't Christians all over the world in every age suffered and died for their genuine faith in Jesus? Why wasn't God acting for their good? Let me ask, what are the promises of God to his people? What were the promises to God to his people from the very beginning, all the way back to Abraham, Genesis 12? What does God promise? He promises them a place, a land where they can be. He promises that they will be a great nation, a multitude of peoples. He promises them that they will be a blessing to others. In 1 Samuel 7, God's acting upon those promises. He's protecting the land he promised. He's protecting the people in it. And by his presence, he is showing the foolishness of following false idols to the nations around them. And that's a blessing to them. What's the highest good for God's people? Is it not to be in his presence, in his eternal kingdom, with all of those who have been brought to faith in Christ throughout all of history? Is it not a real blessing to us to be in that place? All those who trust in Jesus, whose faith is firmly centred on Christ, achieve the fulfilment of all that God has promised to his people from the very beginning. When the earthly life is done, that is our hope. That is our That is the promise of God to us. It's guaranteed that the fulfillment of all his promises will come in his eternal kingdom. We need to go know God as he has revealed himself to us in his word. Only when we know him can we approach him. That is consistent with the way that he's taught us to approach him. For those who are in a right relationship with God through faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus, they can approach him. But it must be done with the highest respect, with reverence, with fear, knowing that God is a holy God, completely pure and perfect in every way, unable to be stained by any failure or wickedness. Whereas we are easily stained and corrupted by sin. We must approach God, knowing through Jesus our sin is forgiven. Knowing that through Jesus we are able to repent. Knowing that through Jesus our salvation is secured. And then, when we know all these things, it will surely help us to approach God humbly, thankfully, respectfully, and fearfully. The way that he's taught us to in his word. And we have full assurance that when we approach God this way, he will always act for the good of his people. I'm going to pray for us. Will you pray with me? Lord our God, we thank you and praise you for your word to us. We ask that we would recognise who you are as you've revealed yourself to be in your word so that we might approach you appropriately according to the way that you have directed in your word with humility and thankfulness with praise upon our lips for all that you have done for us, with acknowledgement of sin that separates us from you, with the acknowledgement that you have done everything to free us from that sin through the giving of your son, Jesus. And help us to do so fearfully, knowing your power and might and authority over all things. And when we approach you this way, Father, we can be assured that you will hear us, And that you will act for our good. And we know that you have acted for our good. For you have given us the promise of everlasting life in Christ. O Lord our God, let us hold on to that hope all our days. For we ask it all in Jesus. Amen. We're going to sing once more. Uh, This time we're singing from Rejoice number 51. Holy, holy, holy.
us hear God's blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit remain and abide with you now and forevermore. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.